Hello everybody, this is Chris and this is the album commentary for the Deadbolt soundtrack. Several of you have asked me to do this and I'm really happy to talk about the music of Deadbolt. Just like I did with Risk of Rain, this one is fully improvised. I don't have anything planned in front of me. Nothing is scripted, so you have to bear with me. I hope it doesn't get off the rails, but uh, the album is about 80 minutes long, so you should expect some nonsense here and there. So let's begin. This is the first track, it's called Now I Am Become Death. I would say it's a nap title, considering the nature of the game and what happens in it. If you're not familiar with the game, you play a reaper that goes out and uh, kills undead. Some people have asked me about the title, especially regarding the grammatical correctness of it. If you're not familiar with the code, it's by Robert Oppenheimer. He was part of the Manhattan Project and uh, when they tested out the first uh, atom bomb, that's what he said, that's half of the code actually. The full one is, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. And just after the first keyboard solo, here's the first guitar solo of the game. I was very lucky this time around uh, doing Deadbolt because I had the privilege of bringing along a couple of friends of mine to work with me on the album. Christos Pirakis plays all the guitars and Thanasi Mustogenis plays the drums where, wherever there are acoustic drums in the album. Both of them I know since I was about 15 or so and we have played together, we grew up together, but we've also played in a lot of different bands, many different styles of music. And they are both wonderful musicians and I was very happy to bring them along. And actually, even though I could find other musicians if I wanted to, I would not really consider it. If I didn't have the opportunity to work with uh, those two specific people, I would probably just do it all on my own, just like I did with uh, Risk of Rain. Here's another keyboard solo. I'm particularly proud for the sound in this one, in this track, I mean, the lead keyboard in this track. I like how expressive it turned out. Uh, I've been asked about my leads, the sound design on them, and I would probably do some video down the line showing a few of them maybe and uh, explaining how the sound is made but uh, usually what I do is I, I approach them in a bit of a guitaristic way. I first uh, start with a simple maybe sine wave or square wave or something like that on a synth and after I tweak the sound to bring it into how I like it, maybe some chords, maybe some unisons and uh, the, the amount of portamento or not, that stuff that you will do on the synth, then I will go on the track and uh, add some guitar effects like overdrive or distortion and uh, some wah pedals and stuff like that that will add a little bit of expression to the sound. 
By the way, that keyboard solo is not part of the track as you hear it in the game. I've made a different version for the album in which uh, you probably didn't notice now because I was talking over it, but if you have heard the track, you might notice that the, the solo kind of lingers on while the music fades away. And to me, that uh, sort of symbolizes the moment that the Reaper becomes the Reaper and accepts his mission and goes out into the night to do all his uh, killing. So this is the second track of the album, it's called Blood on the Dance Floor. It was used in the trailer of the game. This is a slightly different version, I've added a few elements in the music and it's a quite different mix. What you've just heard is the Reaper theme. This is uh, the theme that you can hear in every track of the game. And it's a good opportunity for me to speak about how it came up and uh, how I use the theme while uh, composing or rather designing the soundtrack. I don't know how other composers do it. Some like to probably like to come up with the theme first and then go into writing the music. But what I usually do, especially in cases like that where the pieces of music are not strictly narrative, they're just, you know, parts of a level and they're not telling a story throughout. What I do is I start writing pieces to pinpoint the sound of the game or like the instrumentation and, you know, what kind of atmosphere each uh, piece will give out or, and, the, and the whole soundtrack in total will give out. And at some point in some of the tracks, the theme will just pop up and I will say, okay, this is the theme that I like and that is uh, flexible enough and good enough to be the main theme of the album. And then I will go back into tracks that I are previously composed and I will insert that theme into them. Sometimes it's uh, light surgery where I will, you know, add uh, some layer that will incorporate the theme or something like that, like that. but uh, other times it's quite destructive. I mean, there might be a total rearrangement of the piece to incorporate the theme in it. So here it is, let's listen to it. Actually, in this case, if you pay close attention, you will hear that both of the voices here, the, the, the counterpoint between the two voices, like the pom 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 pom, both of these voices are, are doing variations of the theme. So it's actually just one uh, single unit of music here that is being played against each other. This track is used in the vampire levels and if you have played the game you know that the, the game is divided into three tiers and each tier has different types of enemies. So the first one is uh, zombies, second one is vampires and third one is the skeletons. And one discussion that we had with uh, Duncan and Paul early on was that each of the gangs will have their own style and it will be, uh, you know, the type of music that fits the setting of the gangs. So the zombies have this uh, music that is uh, more urban, inspired by hip-hop and stuff like that, funky. 
and uh, the vampires being creatures of the night, of course, they are nightclub dwellers. So we did all the electronic, the EDM music, if you will. And uh, the more rockish stuff uh, will go to the rock, to the skeleton crew. Listen for the theme here. That's a good example of what I was talking about before, about a piece changing to incorporate the theme, because uh, the, the original riff for this piece was something entirely different, and once I had uh, my theme coming from the previous track, Blood on the Dance Floor, which I think was a fifth or sixth track into the composing uh, process, then I went back into this one, which is by the way called This Pirate Is No More, and I completely changed the main riff to be the theme of the game. Here's a good example of something that I like to do with my music, which is incorporate a bit more complicated rhythms. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is on seven and uh, Although it gets a little bit even more complicated because the guitars are not playing on a strict 7, they, they're playing on a polyrhythm against the drums and the bass, and then the drums go into this sort of 6 plus type of beat. It's a little bit complicated to explain it here in words while listening to it, but uh, if you go to the track and pay close attention to it, you will see that it's a bit of um, clashing rhythms that uh, meet each other after you know X number of bars. Another example of uh, toying around with rhythm here is that when the beat that would normally be the last beat of a bar, as you expect it, becomes the first beat of the, of the next bar, while the previous bar is shortened by one beat. I guess if you're not a trained musician, this might seem like a bit of a mumbo jumbo. Just take my word for it, that it's a rhythmic construction that is just a little bit out of the norm. This track is a very good example of why I wanted to bring Thanasi to play the drums because he's a, a drummer that is very well versed into this uh, complex rhythmic playing and has very good ideas when it comes to it. The way we worked with him is because he's actually in LA and I'm in Greece. So what I would do is uh, prepare demos of the pieces and send them to him via Dropbox. And then he would go into the studio with uh, Nicolas Pharmakalidis, which is the person that engineered the drums. And uh, they would record and would send it back to me in a multi-track. And then I would mix it here in my sessions. But the thing is that I would let Thanasi have a lot of freedom. I mean, I would have, I would give him some points in the track where I was a bit more strict about what he should do because we needed to have, you know, some anchors drum-wise. But other than that, I would tell him, you know, bring your own input to it. I want this to be collaborative, and he did. And this part is no more. is a nice, a very nice showcase of that. As well, of course, with uh, Reap by Death, but we'll get to that later with the drum solo and all. And by the way, the title of this part is No More is a reference to the Monty Python sketch. And now we're listening to Undead Man Walking. The interesting thing about this piece is that when I sent it to Duncan, I think that was the fourth piece I composed, fourth or fifth, somewhere there, 
and we were still not 100% sure about the sound of the game. But when I sent him this piece, he said, okay, now I know the sound of Deadbolt. This is the piece that has this sort of stealth feeling and this uh, planning in the shadows kind of sound. Interestingly enough, the piece originally was just this part, which is on a six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And now the part that comes here was added later after I came up with the theme. The portamento synth is playing the Reaper theme. The part is used here as contrast. Think about this part as somebody that's taking like small steps into the shadows. And then the other one is all the planning that went on, the execution of that planning. A lot of great guitars on this one by Christos. The thing with uh, Christos is that b besides being a, an amazing guitar player, he's also an amazing guitar tech. He did all the engineering of the guitars. Basically, it was him going into the virtual amps that we used and saying, okay, this one should be like that, this one should be like that, this sound needs to be this amp and these settings and these stomp boxes, etc. And without his help, the, sound, the album would not sound nearly as good as it does. I mean, I hope it sounds good. third time that the theme comes it's a variation that goes a little bit downwards and then upwards a bit and then kind of freely moves into a solo and I've had one person send me a message that was like I like the theme here but when it gets too high it gets too high and I was like well yeah sure if it gets too high it gets too high And that was the laughter of Thanasi. In the take that he sent me, he and Nicolas were probably looking at each other after the take was done and for some reason they laughed and the mic picked up Thanasi laughing and I decided what the heck, I will leave it in. And here's another zombie track. This one's called Hey Nong Man. If you're wondering why it's called Hey Nong Man, uh, it's a reference to comedy Bang Bang. I will not go into details about it in this commentary because it's beyond the point, but you can Google it and I'm not guaranteeing that you will find out why and what Hey Nong Man means, but you can try. This is the only guitar in the album that is not performed by Christos or myself and it's a sample we used just because it was a very messy classical guitar and we really liked the sound of it. We we've considered for a while replacing it with our own take but uh, it was just what it needed to be so we decided to leave it as is.
If you notice the sounds that we picked for Deadbolt, especially in tracks like the hip hop tracks, but actually across the board, we used a lot of very traditional, in quotes, sounds. I will talk about that in a minute, but uh, pay attention here. The bass is actually playing a variation of the Reaper theme. So back to what I was saying before about the sounds that we used. Instead of, uh, you know, going in and designing new sounds and weird stuff or, or let's say in, again in quotes original stuff we rather opted in for uh, sounds that are kind of familiar because we were dealing with uh, familiar styles of music we wanted to use sounds that are uh, known to listeners of this particular style so a lot of the keyboards, for example, the electric pianos are kind of uh, DX7 electric pianos that were used in the 80s. We used like the 808 drum machine a lot. Uh, we use electric piano and Wurlitzers and Rhodes in a very traditional way. We used a lot of guitar amps and guitar playing in styles that are already established. Now this is a very conscious choice we made because uh, let me bring Risk of Rain as a counterpoint, as a comparison. In Risk of Rain I've used a lot of spacey sounds, a lot of open stuff, uh, ambience, uh, very long reverbs and a lot of sound, sound design to create original sounds. But that was because Risk of Rain was something that had to do with uh, exploration of the unknown, becoming, um, being on a hostile planet that you're not familiar with. Uh. Deadbolt, on the other hand, while it does have this supernatural element, I mean, you're a Reaper taking missions from a sentient fireplace and you're going out and killing undead people, but still it's very earthly because those are undead gangs, they're basically gangsters or club owners, you know, and uh, it, it takes place here on Earth, so I wanted to have this sort of connection with that, to keep this uh, feeling of uh, familiarity. I guess it's uh, rather ironic that uh, I've started talking about familiarity while the most unfamiliar piece is playing, I guess. A lot of people have asked me what kind of music is this and I don't really have an answer. Although at least one person has commented that uh, this is the one that sounds most like Risk of Rain which is a very interesting comment given the fact that about 80 or 90 even percent of what you're hearing in this track is actually samples taken from Risk of Rain and repurposed and uh, mangled and twisted in various ways so that they create something new but still the original source I guess is there. And if you notice like the little popcorn uh, sound, the, the chip popcorn sound is playing the Reaper theme. And the bass is a classic 303 acid bass, which is again something very familiar. I'm guessing that if you are a person that uh, listens to this uh, type of music, you will be very familiar with, with what I'm talking about. It's a classic uh, bass sequencer from back in the day. You can find the hardware now, but I've used the software emulation of it. 
actually it's a good chance since a lot of people are often asking me about uh, what software and hardware I'm using to create the music. I might as well go into it a little bit. I don't use a lot of hardware stuff. The only hardware stuff I use besides my computer is uh, my uh, two MIDI controllers. Everything else is virtual instruments and effects. So I'm basically doing everything in the box. For the analog synths and drum machines and such that we have in this one, which are heavily used in this one actually, I mean the whole album, not just this track or specifically. Most of the synths that you're listening to are from the Arturia V collection. Now I like hardware synths as much as the next guy, but they can be cumbersome, they are very expensive, they are a little bit more difficult to program sometimes. For example, I, I would love to have a DX7 in my studio, but it is notoriously di difficult to program while having the FM8 equivalent from native instruments is much easier to go into it and tweak the sound to your liking and you know save presets and such. So I usually go for software stuff. It's also much cheaper and it's something to consider because you know we are in the indie scene so I can't afford to pay two thousand dollars for uh, an 808, a hardware 808, when I can find one starting from free because it's sampled from pretty much everybody in the planet right now so you can find the samples for free or you can find a decent emulation of it for an, about 150 euro or something. Same thing with the amps for the guitars, for example. We used uh, Amplitude 3 for all the amps, for both guitar and bass and all the stomp boxes and stuff. In some rare cases we've used the uh, Guitar Rig 5, but that's only when we wanted to do some more sound design -y stuff. Uh, all the traditional guitar sounds are made with Amplitude. This one's called the Proverbial Dust Biters, by the way. A friend of mine has uh, commented that this uh, sounds a lot like late Pink Floyd, like Division Bell, or maybe a momentary lapse of reason. The Post Waters era, maybe. I would say that that's definitely correct, especially coming into this part of the music. And I would add to those influences that of uh, Porcupine Tree and uh, Stephen Wilson in general, like his later project uh, Blackfield and then his own solo stuff. But that Hammond organ that comes in here is 100% Rick Wright, the keyboard player from Pink Floyd. And this whole section is definitely inspired by the Division Bell. I was actually a little bit bummed that uh, when we printed the solo and we mastered the track, I realized that we should have, in, in, on one of the phrases of the solo, add this uh, trademark Gilmore phrase that he does with the guitar with a double bend when he goes wow wow wow. It would definitely fit into this solo.
listen to the guitar becoming in Hammond and then becoming a synth. As I've mentioned before about Thanasi uh, letting him to bring his own material and his own ideas into the drumming, uh, the same thing happened with uh, Christos and even to a much larger degree because he was involved in practically all of the tracks and he was here in Athens with me and we had this very, very close collaboration where we would spend countless hours discussing the music and sending files back and forth and him being here in the studio and not just talking about the guitars but um, discussing the mixing, the instrumentation, the form of all the music which makes this album much different from everything else that I've done because uh, my past work has been very solo, if you will something that I was always doing very much on my own. Well, this one is very collaborative. This is a good example of that uh, contribution of Christos into the music because uh, a lot of times I would send him very raw basic ideas like a drum beat and a couple of chords on an uh, electric piano or on the bass or something and I would tell him now you're free uh, send me guitars to go on top of that and he would definitely send me guitars So all the guitars you're listening to here were not my original ideas. Uh, Christos brought those, all this Nile Rodgers type of playing. By the way, this one's called The Way of the Dodo. For the titles in this album, I made a list of uh, euphemisms about death had like a master list somewhere and then one of the tracks were uh, pretty much coming to life and I was seeing how they will sound. I would go into the list and pick from the titles and just, you know, assign them to tracks. In this particular track, if you are uh, paying attention to instances of the Reaper theme and variations of it throughout the album, you will notice that the main melody is indeed a variation of the Reaper theme, but this particular one is uh, very special. There it is on the electric piano. <laughs> So this one is uh, actually a theme from a Greek TV show of the 90s which has become kind of a cult hit and its theme song has been elevated to a kind of a punchline into jokes and I was really fond and also Christos and Thanasis we were all fond of this show a lot and I was jamming one day trying to come up with a solo here and I noticed that the theme, the Reaper theme is very close to the main theme of that TV show so I decided that I will uh, reference it here. You can listen it to the lead synths. Actually, I will put a link to the actual theme in the video description so that you can uh, compare if you like.
people with headphones or people paying close attention to the music might have noticed that we went to mono for a little while then at the end of the phrase the the song opened up into stereo again just at the ending there And this one is Reaper and Blues. And if you notice the, th the motive on the background electric piano, this one. Doo -doo 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 -doo. It's the same theme used in uh, Reap by Death. And actually, Reap by Death it was composed first, and then that uh, little motive was used in, in this one. I really like this uh, beat here, it's kind of shuffle, laid back. This is one of the two pieces that were just fragments of an idea. There were like eight bars that I've written with a couple of guitars in them that for a very long time were just that, were like two 40 second loops that I had sent to Duncan and it was used in, un, even until the beta version of the game, just like that. And I actually went and made them into full length pieces very late in the game with a lot of contribution from Christos because he sent a lot of all, all the slide guitars and all that stuff were not there uh, when I was working on it and it, it was, they were original stuff that he brought and not stuff that I asked him to overdub or play or anything like that. It's 100% his original stuff. Just like this guitar actually. The actual performance of this guitar is just the downbeats and we used a combination of two delays, a stereo delay rather, to create this feeling that you're also playing the upstroke. So it was more like... And we made it... I don't know if that makes any sense. Actually, that's a good time to mention that if you have any more questions or want to ask me about something that I won't mention in this commentary, please leave a comment. Those of you that are subscribers on my YouTube channel know that I reply to most of the comments, especially when they have to do with musical stuff. I love to talk shop, I love to talk about music and get geeky, so the more geeky answers you want, the more geeky answers you will get. I really like how during this outro the track becomes a little bit more glitchy and this uh, there's a low pass filter closing in making it less shiny and a little bit more to the background. This weird delay. I was actually made using an, an isotope delay DDLY that they released while the, I was working on the album. They, they released it for free and I was like, hmm, okay, it's a free isotope effect, let's try it. And it's a really weird kind of dual delay that can do granular, granular, blah, granular delay stuff. I'm keeping that in actually, I'm not gonna edit it out. So that was Reaper and Blues and now we're moving into Hemolysis, which is another vampire track. And if you Google what Hemolysis means, 
you will realize why this is a vampire track. This one is also interesting rhythmically because I've chosen this uh, weird uh, time signature of 13, 13 eighths. Let's count them together. One, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, etc. Which is a really non-common time signature, especially in Western music, which most of it is uh, based on 4-4 four, four, or 3-4. But actually, th those kind of uh, complex uh, rhythms and odd time signatures like 7, 9, 11, 5 are not that uncommon in the Balkans or the Middle East or, the, or India. And uh, me being uh, from Greece, I've, I grew up listening to such uh, odd rhythms all the time, especially the 7 is very common, the 9 is very common where I come from. So I really like to use them in my music. And of course it's a major part of pro the progressive rock sound, which is a very uh, important influence to me. But the difference actually between how progressive music usually incorporates odd rhythms uh, versus how they are found in the Balkan areas or the Middle East or, the, or India or other places is that usually progressive music is doing variations of the four or the three or the six when it's doing seven or when it's doing nine. So a seven usually in, in the Western world is like a hunch eight. I don't know if that makes sense. While in the Balkans, for example, it's not like that at all. It's something very different. It's a true seven where the sevenness of it, if you allow me this uh, neologism, is inherent to the music. It's inherent in the lyrics, it's inherent in the, in the dancing, everything. And here's the main theme the, of the album here, in the synths. Again with this track, the main part of it was composed first and then I went on and did the two B parts, if you will which are very contrasting. They go into four, which is like the traditional rhythm that we're used to. And actually the harmony also changes into this very classical harmony as a way of contrasting what came before it. And even doing a little bit of counterpoint. I would like to think of this as like the Baroque moment of the album. And again, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two. And this one's called Werner und Klaus. The title is a reference to two things. One of them is this track being inspired by the German electronic dance music of the 80s. The other thing is a reference to Nosferatu, the remake of the original by Werner Herzog in which uh, Klaus Kinski was the star playing the vampire. Mm -hmm. 
Werner Herzog is not just one of my favorite directors, but also one of my favorite humans. And if I have the opportunity to, you know, reference him somewhere in my music, then I will gladly do it. It's really obscure in this case, but if you uh, pay very close attention to the popcorn little sound that plays in the background, that's where I've hid another variation of the Reaper theme in this one. And then also this lead synth that now actually takes over and plays the theme. I think that's one of the two pieces in the entire album that actually don't have any guitars. It's this one and Break of Dawn. It's also one of the instances that we've used the uh, TR-808 drum machine from Roland, or at least uh, it's a virtual counterpart. If you're familiar with the sound of it, then you'll probably recognize both the kick drum, but definitely like the clap sound that it has. By the way, if you enjoy the music, you can find a link to buy it in the description. I think it's okay, we're after the halfway point of the album if I do one plug to it. I hope you forgive me for that. It really helps me out if you guys support me like that, because then I can keep on making music. Pay attention to the synth that will remain after the music stops, especially its pitch. You might notice that it's going a bit on and off tune there. I wanted to have the sort of uh, tape playing in the wrong speed type of sound. And I've used a plugin from Waves called uh, ADT automatic double tracking which does exactly that you feed it with uh, sound and then it has this couple of virtual tape heads which are uh, sort of uh, losing accuracy as the sound comes through them and it's tweakable to your taste you can add distortion to it or something but um, the main point is that it creates a bit of the wrong tuning a little bit to the sound depending on the amount of uh, the effect what was originally used for it was, uh, it was actually in, uh, created for John Lennon when he was in the Abbey Road studios because he didn't want to go in and do another take of his vocals to make them sound fatter and thicker. Because if you go over your vocals and do another take, they, they will be on the same melody, but it won't be the exact same take and that creates this sort of chorus effect. But he was, you know, too busy, air quotes, to do that. So he told the engineers, I don't know, you guys figure it out. And what they did was this created this sort of loop of the vocal take going into another tape recorder that the, the head was uh, wobbling a little bit, creating this effect of uh, mis displacing the take. But enough about the Beatles and history of Abbey Road. This one's called The Banality of Eternity. 
And the reason I chose that name is because originally this track was the longest one in the album. It was uh, about six minutes long. And uh, to me, this is the piece that sounds really heavy. I've actually had trouble mixing the track and find, and, and generally while working on it, I would get really down and almost depressed by the sound because it has this sort of, you know, overwhelmingly sad sound, at least to me. The synth on the left side is very inspired by the ad-lib sound that you would hear in the soundtrack of Gabriel Knight 1, if you had the, an ad-lib sound card or, or a sound blaster or so. And somebody commented this exact thing that it reminds them of Gabriel Knight and I was really surprised by that. You can't hide, you can't hide from people. But seriously, I'm very excited when people, you know, discover the little things in the music. Obviously this track is a nod to the synth pop music of the 80s with all those, uh, you know, early synthesizers and the, the, the overuse of the particular sound that they had and the drum machines and such. a real hard time uh, with this track figuring out at the form and how long it's going to be and what what will happen until while I was working on the bonus track of the album I realized that if you reverse the acoustic guitars that are part of the track at some point uh, it creates this really interesting uh, effect given the particular chord pro progression. So actually after the track was mixed and I was still not very happy with it, I went back and changed a couple of things, which is a really not healthy thing to do, especially on a deadline. And this is the other track that, uh, when, back when I was talking about Reaper and Blues, I said that two of the tracks were just uh, small, like 40 second loops that were just laying there waiting to become full-fledged pieces, and that's the other one of them. And this is the track that has the most obscure instance of the Reaper theme, the most hidden one. I will talk about it when it comes up again but it's literally impossible to, to find unless you know it. This is uh, definitely one of my favorites from the album and one when, where Christo's contribution is really what made the track. Now notice the ride symbol here.
as I said, it's impossible to figure out on your own, but what I actually went and did is that I took the sample of the ride symbol and tuned it so that it reflects the Reaper theme. And this is the guitar I was talking about previously, about Christus's contribution. I think this is like a super major contribution to the album, which I really, really love. I mean, this is what made the track to me. Because afterwards, the, the brass that comes in is based on that. And basically all this section has spawned from this funky guitar. All the guitars that you hear from this point on after the funky theme comes in are stuff that I didn't actually write and I just uh, had the initial parts of the piece and sent it to Christos and told him feel free to come up with some parts for this and he did, boy did he. And another thing about working with Christos is that he didn't just bring the ideas and then leave it up to me to arrange them and put them in the music, but he would be heavily involved in how they would be implemented in, in the piece. Because uh, oftentimes I would have these amazing pieces that he would have, and partly because of the excitement of having these amazing elements of music, but also because I didn't want to, you know, offend him in any way, I would put them all in the in the music and uh, you know mix them here and there then he would come and say no no that's too much let's take out and he would cut down his own takes into more coherent fragments of music that would really elevate the track And here's uh, one case that you can hear vocals in my music. It's a very rare occasion. Actually, I'm not even sure if it's ever done before. Nobody has commented on that actually, which makes me a little bit sad. Boo hoo. This little vocoded section of vocals is inspired by John Coltrane's A Love Supreme. I used his uh, motive that he uses there. He, uh, at some point during the first piece of the album, he starts chanting A Love Supreme. And I thought, okay, I can reference that. Because I needed to add a little bit some of something in the track. And I thought a, a vocoder would be nice. And that's what I picked. It is actually saying a death supreme in my version. And here's the other track without any guitars, Break of Dawn. Now, by the way, the previous track is was called Defunctorum, and you should uh, Google it. It's a Latin word to see how it is related to death. Originally, Defunctorum is spelled with a C, but I've changed the spelling to accommodate for the funky sound of the track. And this one's called Break of Dawn, and if you're wondering what does this have to do with death, Consider that this one is a vampire track and what does the break of dawn do to a vampire?
definitely another example in which I shoehorned the main Reaper theme into the track long after the track was originally... Actually, this one was practically completed and then I went in and do, did some changes to incorporate the theme. This one again uses the 808 drum machine. Another reason that this one is called Break of Dawn is because we knew that we would have these club tracks, but I really wanted to have one of them to be a type of music that I imagine is being played in the first morning hours, like, I don't know, seven or eight, when the sun comes up after a very long night of, of dancing and everyone is tired and, you know, this is what you, what the DJ will put to bring everyone down you know, and have them chill out. And here's the Reaper theme in the synths. Actually, a very well-hidden easter egg in this one is that the electric piano in the background is uh, playing the solo from Daft Punk's Something About Us. Starting here. You probably heard me uh, mentioning Daft Punk again, is a very strong influence in my music, especially their album Discovery. I consider it the best album that I've ever heard in my life and I'm including in those albums everything that pop music has to offer. I put it above like Sgt. Pepper's, Abbey Road, which are like super influential albums for me, or you know, The Wall, or Wish You Were Here, or I don't know, A Night at the Opera from Queen. I, I put it above all those albums. And here we are, Reaped by Death. And yes, I just did gloss over the Troll 2 sample that's used in the track. I think it speaks for itself, nothing more to say about it. I really, really love this piece because it's just me and Christos and Thanasi just jamming. There's no production tricks, no, you know, complicated effects or stuff like that. It's just drums, bass, guitar. That's it. Listen for the Reaper theme in the guitars here. For a long time this track was called uh, Too High to Die and we've changed it to Read by Death as a reference to Lemmy Kilmister who died in the late 2015, the frontman of Motorhead. Motorhead had a piece called uh, Killed by Death. I mean, honestly, Christos I did himself in this solo. I just love it.
And if you pay attention to the third part of the solo coming up after this section, you will notice a little bit of a flanger effect used, which is basically a reference to the sound of uh, Jimi Hendrix. Notice the ending of the solo, the bend, here. And obviously a drum solo coming now. Do I even need to comment on that? By the way, if you listen to the sound, to the mix of the drums, generally throughout the album, yeah, I always uh, like to mix my drums uh, player perspective. So it's as if I am sitting in the, on the drums and playing. I've talked about this uh, a few times. Because I am a drummer myself, I, whenever I listen to a recording that is mixed uh, audience perspective, I feel it takes me out basically because I want to feel that I'm sitting in the drum stool and playing along. So I always mix the drums uh, as if I'm sitting there, which means that you know the high tom is slightly to the left, the floor tom is to the right, the hi-hat is a bit to the left. This uh, little piece of noise, which I call Limbo for the album, is not actually a separate piece of music. It's just uh, the outro of, the, of Rip by Death. And it's created by using a couple of uh, delay effects and some distortion and bit crushing on some of the guitars at the end of the piece. And the only reason that is a different piece in the in the album release is that I wanted people that you know want to want to include uh, "Reap by Death" into playlists and such that they don't have to be burdened with a 50 second outro that is uh, just noise. So you're welcome. And the next one's called Dies Irae, which is Latin for Day of Wrath. It's a hymn that is uh, used in the Mass of Requiem. If you pay close attention to this one, you might listen to some vinyl scratches and clicks and pops in the sound, part of the sound design that is, which are also used in some of the other tracks. Which is uh, again part of the conscious decision that I made to have this album be uh, very familiar, having this familiar sound. If you listen closely to the bass, there's a synth that is uh, utilizing the Reaper theme.
for this track we had the first part and for a long time I wasn't really sure how the, the piece would evolve and develop. So I, at some point I went into this uh, build-up session. I was not entirely sure where would it build up towards and um, eventually we came up with a, uh, with a you know, hard rock section that comes in the end. But what's interesting about this is that um, once we, we started building it, uh, we had this, created this sort of feedback loop where we would lay the tracks and then uh, we would say, okay, let's make it a little bit uh, harder. And we would go and, and change a little bit of the sound of the guitar or overdub it or double track it with another guitar. And then we would say, well, now it needs to reflect that change in the drums. So we would go to the drums and add more strength to them. And then we'd, we'd say, well, now the drums are too strong for this, the bass that we have here. And then we go to the bass and maybe add overdrive. And then we would go back to the guitar and say, well, now the whole rhythm section is too strong for this guitar. And we add a wah-wah pedal and then we added a bit of uh, distortion in the actual drums and some uh, double kick drums. And then we would add an auto wah on the bass to have that also be, you know, doing like a wah wah thing. And eventually this started from a hard rock section into this really strong metal section with chinas and double kick drums and all that stuff. Again, Christos brought to me those guitars that are playing the and what actually happened is that he sent me three variations of those guitars and he said, well, pick one and uh, we'll see, you know, whichever you like and maybe we can use it in the outro to beef up the sound a little bit. And then uh, because they were a little bit different rhythmically, I, I thought, okay, let's start with one and then let's spread them out left and right and have both of them playing against each other and then add the one again in the middle and create this kind of counterpoint between the three of them and make this really full, active piece of music that is really tense. And here's a piece that has become fan favorite, I would say. A lot of people have commented about loving this this piece of music. This one actually I credited as being composed by Christos and I. And I use Christos' name first because at some point I asked him besides all the music that uh, you're sending me for the pre-existing tracks, if you have any themes, motives, ideas for independent pieces of music that you feel might uh, you know, fit this uh, sonic world, why don't you send them to me and see if we can make something out of it. And he sent me a few things. This wasn't one of them, but uh, when I listened to it, I was like, okay, this one we're definitely using. And uh, in a couple of days, I sent him pretty much the entire track made like that, based on his uh, original opening guitar arpeggios that he sent, which are really wonderful. I also got very positive feedback from uh, Duncan when I sent him this piece. He really liked it too. And in a move that is reminiscent to him using call lessons in the last level of Risk of Rain, he used this one for the final uh, mission in Deadbolt. It's very fitting because it has this, uh, you know, somber atmosphere. It gives you a little bit of time to contemplate on the whole journey.
One interesting thing that we did in this section is that we took uh, one single guitar note. If you listen in the background, there's a guitar playing that is just kind of a long note, a pad almost. Listen now, that will go higher. You can rewind if you didn't catch it, but uh, there's this uh, sustained note that lasts for more than a minute, which is quite long for a guitar note, or a guitar string to, you know, uh, vibrate. And of course we boosted it with uh, compression and overdrive and a bunch of other effects to create this uh, pad, overarching pads throughout this whole section. And that was just us having fun in the studio because obviously it's something that we could have easily done or at least approximated with any synth. Throwing a bunch of overdrive on it and long delays and stuff and creating a very similar sound. But we really wanted to do it with a guitar and to those of you who, who are um, more versed into the guitar world, we didn't use an Ebo. So it's a really one single stroke of the string with the pick and then just sustaining it uh, with a little bit of uh, finger vibrato and uh, yeah, compression overdrive. And of course we actually used the guitar that has very high gain. I have a, an Ibanez guitar here that has a really strong gain output. And now we're listening to the final, oh by the way the previous track was uh, called Ashes to Ashes to Ashes to Ashes. And this one is the Choir Invisible. This may be is my favorite track of the album. It's hard to tell because there are so many different styles that uh, depending on my mood, you know, I have different favorites, but from the rock tracks, uh, this is probably my favorite. I like this kind of dark atmosphere that it has. I, I chose to use uh, this theremin sound to, you know, convey this ghostly feeling. But what I really like about it is that the piece is in minor and the melody practically travels down through E flat minor. Bold move, but works within the atmosphere of the piece. I asked from Christos to send me some acoustic guitars for this part and what he sent was basically exactly what I had in mind, which is this sort of western, you know, something that you would listen as background music on a duel. I really love how this build-up approaches here and kind of uh, rapidly bursts. This lead guitar that plays here, we wanted it a bit more beefed up for the next part and what we ended up doing is that we copied it into three new tracks and we detuned it into a minor chord that we spread across the stereo field. And it's a minor chord that moves in parallel with the entire melody, so basically something that would otherwise be done with a harmonizer, perhaps. But we did it by actually copying so that we had a bit more of control on both the sound, but also the exact notes that constitute the chord with each note instance.
And again, using this uh, weird delays here to create a soundscape, just like we did with Limbo, but a bit more controlled here, a bit more musical. And that's the end of the Dead World soundtrack and this album commentary. I would like to thank everybody that has made it this far very, very, very much. I hope that you have found this uh, enjoyable or at the very least listenable. I'm going to assume that if you have made it so far into the commentary, then you really like this album. So I would kindly ask you to consider clicking the Bandcamp link and buying it. It really helps me and uh, gives me the, the opportunity to, you know, keep on making music like this. Or not like this. And also, please share that link with other people that you think might enjoy it. Post your favorite videos on your social media, that really helps a lot. And even share them with your favorite game developers on Twitter and such. You have my blessing to spam them with it. By the way, we're listening to Lux Perpetua, which is a bonus track that can only be heard in the Bandcamp version of the album and it's a collage of uh, bits and pieces from the album that I've put into a session and arranged uh, into this uh, 13 minute long uh, ambient piece of music. Before I sign off I would like to remind you that if you have any further questions about the album you can uh, leave a comment on YouTube and uh, I'm happy to discuss it with you and clarify. But uh, also let me know if there are any specific stuff within the album that you would like to see you know, a video dealing directly with those and I will consider uh, doing it in the near future. Once again thank you very much for listening and take care.